Welcome, especially if uh, you're joining us for the first time. My name is Andrew, I'm married to Nikki. Uh, we're part of the leadership team for the Lifehouse. Um, if you are with us for the first time, do fill out a, a welcome form with Chris at the back, uh, and then you'll get the marvellous newsletter uh, and you'll, you'll know what's going on. Um, not only are you welcome here, we were praying before the meeting and Julie had a picture of a, of a gate only and we are welcome in heaven. But not just, you are welcome here, but you are also welcome in heaven into the presence of God. Uh, and that's, that's why we're here today. We want to meet with God and uh, praise Him and also learn from Him as well. Um, so the running order for today, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have George leading worship. Uh, I, I, I'm going to try that again. We're going to have George leading worship. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yes, that is more likely. Uh, then the kids are going to go out and then Mark is going to speak to us. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then there's going to be a few other things as well. We're going to have, uh, we're going to break bread. We're going to remember, remember on Sunday as well. So lots going on. Um, now a few notices. We had stopped taking offerings. Um, before uh, during COVID, we are going to start doing that again today. We're going to go around uh, later. Um, you can put things into them. You can also take things out of them. Don't take the money out, but, but there are like little bits of paper and things you can take out. There's envelopes or there's pieces of paper with more information. So feel free to take those bits out. Okay, great. Um, what else have I got in terms of uh, notices? Um, everything's in the newsletter, but I do want to draw attention to the Christmas services which are coming up. And, uh, I, Christmas is, I, we love Christmas, right? I love yes. Christmas. Uh, Christmas is actually a very special, Christmas services are very special for me because that's when I really made a decision to follow Jesus. I was at a Christmas carol service. Uh, so very special. Uh, do be praying for them as they come. We're going to be on the 18th of December, the Sunday before Christmas. We're going to have one in Banbury at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then another one in Bicester at 12.30. You don't have to go to both. Some of us will, because we're mad, and we'll be running between them. Come to whichever one is right for you. Invite your friends. Have a great time. Put it in your diaries, it's going to be great. Okay. And the 11th. And the 11th. What's on the 11th? Crafts and games and things like that. So, here. Somebody, somebody who knows what's going on should have given that notice. So, I apologise for everybody who's involved in the Christmas planning. Um, carol service on the 18th. Crafts and things like that on the 11th. Right. Um, I thought we could start. Uh, with Remembrance Sunday uh, prayer. It's hard to read. Is it hard to read? Okay. Uh, Nikki's going to come up and just lead us in prayers. So I'm just going to read this out. Um, thank you, Lord, that we live in a country at peace and we have freedom. Thank you for those who sacrificed to make that possible and for the families of those affected. We bring to mind the war in Ukraine, where there are people with evil intent thwart their plans, where there are people who strive for freedom, give them wisdom and success. Lord, where there are people who are vulnerable and displaced, guard them with your love. They are our neighbours. Help us not to walk by on the other side when they most need our help. Thank you, Jesus, that we have a future where there is no more war or suffering. Bring it soon, Lord. Amen. 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 
I'm going to worship. We believe in a two-way communication. Oh, this George, by the way, again. He, he got the prompt when I said I'm going to worship God. Uh, we're going to worship. We believe in two-way communication with God. We want to sing our praises to God. We also want to hear anything God wants to say to us. If you feel like God's given you a picture or a verse from the Bible or anything like that, do come and find me, come and tell me, and we will uh, see if we can uh, share that at an appropriate point. Uh, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to George. Not yet. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, uh, friends, we stand as we um, enter the Lord's presence. Um, and yes, yeah, as, as we meet with God in worship, let's um, let's just invite Him in. Let's um, spend a moment um, uh, asking to meet with Him. God loves um, us and loves to meet with us, and we want to uh, meet with Him to our state. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Yeah. Lord God, we want to meet with you. We say that. We want to encounter you here. Spirit, come and fill this room. Fill each of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Yeah. 
um, this song is full of metaphors of what it looks like to put our hope and our trust in Jesus rather than the things in life that we might put our trust in, whether that's money or ambition or relationship. The song speaks about how Jesus is something solid and dependable. And this bit about him being a cornerstone comes from a passage in the Psalms where it talks about how the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. When you're building a wall or a house, you want bricks that are uniform to build the walls. So you probably throw away the ones that are a funny shape. They don't quite fit what you're building. But when it comes to the, the stone that you put on the top or the stone that you put on the corners, you want the stones that are a funny shape because they're the perfect shape for that part of the building. Now, Jesus was rejected, he was crucified because he claimed to be the Son of God and that was something that the people in the Jewish culture at the time viewed as a crime. He was rejected, but he has been resurrected. He is our God, he is our King. And the message of Jesus is a message of finding hope from rejection. We, too, are transformed from being that, that funny shape, that, that stone that might not fit. God says to you today, you fit. You are what I want. You are the stones that I will build my church from. He has a place for you. In Jesus, we're not rejected. We are saved, and we are built into something bigger. We are built into Jesus' family. So yeah, uh, Lord Jesus, would we would we find our hope in you today? Yes. Would we be set free from rejection? Yes. Uh, as we trust in you above the material things in this world, would you give us a fresh understanding of who we are in you yes. and the plans and the purposes you have for us as we build us into this wall, this building, this church of yours. Christian. 
It's a, it's a simple prayer. It goes, sorry, thank you, please, which makes it easy for me to remember. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to pray along in your hearts if you want. Jesus, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. I'm not as good as you made me to be. Thank you, Jesus, that you died so that I could have life and be forgiven. Please fill me with your presence, with your love, with your Holy Spirit, so that I can follow you every day. Amen. Amen. Okay, Nikki, you can get the bread ready. We've got no bread and free from bread and cranberry juice. Uh, if people can come up and take what they like and uh, yeah, please break the bread. Excellent. And yeah, the millennial seats, in whatever way is meaningful for you, remember Jesus. George, if you want to just strum along the last step, this bit. Up. I think the uh, young people get to go guys. I don't know about you, but my last couple of years have smelled like this stuff a lot. And I, um, 
just clean my hands before we, I broke the bread. Um, and I just felt like God spoke to me and said, hand sanitizer is great for making your hands clean. He wants to wash us on the inside. And that's what this is about. Um, that actually God wants to come inside and change us and wash away the dirt and the sin that gets us caught away. Um, so I'm just going to pray now. Father, would you come and wash us on the inside as we take bread and wine and remember your sacrifice. Help us to come to Jesus with our sin and the things that get in the way of us getting close to you and allow you to wash us and make us clean again. Amen. good opportunity for me to just say that as a church we do appreciate everybody who gives. Uh, the church can't meet together or minister uh, without people's uh, kindness and generosity. So thank you for everybody who's, uh, who, who gives so faithfully. Uh, Mark, I think it's time to hand over to you. Someone turn me on while well, I don't know where it, the PA man disappears just at that point. <laughs> Great, and maybe tell me down on it. <laughs> Good. Brilliant. For those who don't know me, my name Mark. I'm pastor of Lifehouse Community Church. I'm married to Catherine and lead Lifehouse, and it's so good to be together. It's so good to worship him and be in his presence. Um, thank you, George, for leading me to worship. It's just good to spend time with God. Um, I need a little bit of help from you. Um, if you see this about to fall, I want you to shout at me so I can quickly grab it. Hopefully it's going to stay there, not fall. Um, but you might need to shout in case it does. We are looking at uh, how did Jesus make disciples. Uh, today we're looking at seeing. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> doesn't say in the Bible, the wicked witch says it to the mirror every day. Who's the fairest of them all? And she's after a response. What she wants to hear back is, you are. But one day, she doesn't hear that, and instead, she's shown a picture of Snow White. And the story goes on from there. And we're not going to look at that story today, don't worry. We're going to look at the Bible. Uh, but sometimes we can look in the mirror and we can see ourselves in different ways, depending on what day of the week it is, depending on what we faced, depending on if it's the start of the day or the end of the day. We might look at ourselves in a certain way. I want to look at Luke. Five, if you've got your Bibles. If you haven't, there is some spares kicking around somewhere, but I can't 
can't remember where, at the back of the, yeah, if, there, if you need one, there is one there. We're going to look at Luke 5, verses 1 to 11 on your phones or Bibles, whatever you might have. We're going to look at discipleship and all about seeing. Uh, Luke 5, it starts with this. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked, all, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he had he for he had he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed him. We're going to look at two main points today. We're going to look at what Peter sees in Jesus, and then we're going to go on and look at what does Jesus see in Peter, and then we're going to finish that off. Great, so Peter sees in Jesus, uh, he sees authority, he sees the miraculous, he sees holiness, uh, he sees someone to follow, there's a following that takes place. Peter sees an authority in Jesus. It says in verse 5, he calls him master. He sees that there's something about Jesus that's different. He sees there's an authority there. He's fished all night. They've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing. In those waters, the best time to fish is at night time. All the fishermen would have been out. They would have all been fishing at night. That's the time when they were going to catch any fish. And yet Jesus says to him, go and put your nets out. It's the middle of the day. If that was me, I'd be thinking, Who's this guy telling me to go and put my nets out, even though I've been out all night and I've caught nothing? And I fish these waters every day. I'm a fisherman by trade, that's what I do. It's in my blood, I know what I'm doing. Here, Peter recognizes there's an authority in Jesus. He doesn't question it, it might be in his mind, I don't know can't read his mind but in the text he doesn't question it he finds there's an authority with Jesus an authority that he's prepared to follow him prepared to do what he asks sometimes Jesus asks us to do things even when we don't understand we can't see why. We don't understand what he's asking of us. There's something about us knowing that Jesus is someone who's worth following. Knowing that he's worth us laying down 
whatever we think is right in order to follow what he is doing. Peter finds an authority in him. He knows the master's voice when he speaks. Peter sees the miraculous. In verse 6, there's more fish than they know what to do with. More fish just for one boat that he calls his friends over. Come and help us. We need your help. This, it's one of the first signs of, of the miracles of what Jesus is about to do. He gives them a taste of something. Put down your nets and bring up this hole. Peter's eyes begin to be opened to the power that Jesus has. Are we open to the power that Jesus has? Are we open to what Jesus can do? I bet we've heard stories. I bet we've even seen it possibly in our own lives. God wants to really open our eyes today to know the power that he can do. We take things for granted. I was miraculously healed when I was 17. I tore all the ligaments in my, in my ankle and in my leg. And I was supposed to be on crutches for a long time. People prayed for me and I went out carrying those crutches. I've tasted something of the miraculous. Noah and I were driving from the celebration on Sunday um, to football, to his football game, and it was lashing it down. The rain was falling, I was thinking, this isn't going to be good. This is not going to be a good game. An hour or so stood in this. Oh, couldn't think of anything worse. And so I said to him, let's pray. Let's pray that the rain stops as soon as we pull up. Do you know what happened? The rain stopped. The miraculous took place. I got out of the car and greeted the coach who'd been putting up the goals in the rain, absolutely soaked. And he goes to me, so where have you been? And he knew where we were, he knew how we were late. And I said to him, well, do you know what? We've just been praying that the rain would stop. And he said, well, I can't argue with that, can I? <laughs> the miraculous, Peter tastes the miraculous. We get to taste the miraculous too. I know you've got stories of the miraculous as well. He tastes something of holiness, he sees Jesus as holiness. You would think he would say, hey, Jesus, wow, that's amazing. We caught nothing last night, but now look what you've done. Instead he goes, get away from me. Get away from me. He recognizes Jesus' holiness. He's awestruck. He's in Jesus' presence and he recognises that he's a sinful man. The good thing is that Jesus doesn't go away. Actually, Jesus welcomes us no matter where we're at. Whatever we're facing. Our struggles, our sins, the things that we've got wrong. The things that we think no one can forgive us for, Jesus forgives us. He sets us free and lets us dwell in his holiness. That's what we've been doing as we've been worshipping him. We've been in the spirit of the Lord, we've been dwelling in God's holiness. Lastly, uh, Jesus, uh, Peter sees 
that he's someone worth following. They just had this miraculous catch. They've got all these fish. And Jesus says, come with me. And they just like walk off. That's my impression. I don't actually know, but my impression is like they dropped the nets and just walked off and there's this mound of fish. That's like, what do you mean? It's like throwing away a load of five pound notes or 20 pound notes, isn't it? Just sat there, this pound. But they see that actually there's something more than the fish. There's something more than the material items that are there. Peter has a revelation that Jesus is worth following. He's worth laying everything aside, laying everything to one side and, and following him. So that's how uh, Peter sees Jesus. Uh, Jesus then has ideas about how he sees Peter. He sees an identity, he sees a purpose, he sees a commissioning. He wants to commission Peter. Uh, Matthew 16, 13 to 19 says, When Jesus came to the reign, uh, sorry, start again. When Jesus came to the region of Carcia Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others still say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus sees something in Peter that he doesn't see. He sees a fresh identity. We look in the mirror and sometimes we see the things that we've done wrong, our failures. We think we're not worthy, we think we're not good enough. Jesus sees something completely different. Jesus wants to come and give us a fresh identity, a fresh belief in who he calls us to be. Uh, in John it says this, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, Cephas, which when translated is Peter. He gives him a new identity. He renames him. I think actually it's not necessarily a new identity but actually he releases him into how Jesus sees him. There's a releasing of identity that goes on. Because God knew him before he was even born. God created him. God knew him before he was in his mother's womb. Just like each of us. What's going on is Jesus goes, I already know you. I already know who you are, but you don't see it. But I want to release a fresh identity to you. I want to open your eyes. I can see you're more than a fisherman. I want to release 
that in you. God wants to release that in us today. He wants to open our eyes. He wants us to know that we are created by him and loved by him. And release a fresh identity. Uh, secondly, a purpose. Um, he gives, Jesus sees that Peter has a purpose and a calling. He says that he's going to be the rock on which the church is going to be built. Just like Abraham, he was renamed, wasn't he? Because he was told that he'd be the father of many. Abraham didn't see that himself. He thought it was a bit of a joke. He laughed. He tried to make it happen in his own ways. Yet God saw something in him. God was doing something. I reckon Peter's brother's going, what? That guy? He's going to be the rock? You're going to build the church on him? This big-handed, rough fisherman. I'm adding in some of my own interpretation in my mind. Uh, having known some fishermen. <laughs> he gives him a purpose. He gives him a calling. The thing is that it was Peter's calling, not anyone else's calling. God wants to release our identity today that we take on our calling. George is called to be George. He's called to walk in the plans and purposes that God has for George. Yeah, not anyone else, not someone else's calling but the purposes that God has for him. <clears throat> because Peter recognised who Jesus was and declared he was the Messiah, Jesus had that word for him. As we declare who Jesus is, he wants to release the plans and purposes that he has for us. Thirdly, we then see that Jesus brings a commissioning. Uh, in verse 10, we see that he says, no longer will you fish for fish, but you'll fish for men. There's a sending out that goes on. Jesus wants to send us out doesn't want us to just know we have a new identity, a new identity in Christ. He doesn't want us to just know the calls and plans and purposes on our lives, but he wants to release us into them. He wants us to walk in that identity. So we see there that Jesus has vision. Peter's had a revelation of who Jesus is. That Jesus has more vision for Peter than he could imagine. Jesus has more vision for us than we could imagine. We're called to be like Jesus, aren't we? And so if we're called to be like Jesus, then we're also called to see something in others. We're called to release others. We're called to disciple. 
says in the Bible, go and make disciples of all nations. Not just those that are evangelists, not those that work full time for church, not just those people over there. We're all called to go and make disciples. That become like Jesus, not like us. And there's a few things that I was thinking of. We looked a little bit at this. Uh, we were running a leadership training course yesterday and we looked at a few of these things. Um, there's something about us giving others opportunity. How do we do ourselves out of a job that releases others? How do we take others with us that we get to release the potential that God's given to them? We're called to make disciples. My heart is that I want to see everyone released to their callings, whatever that might be, wherever that might be. We don't hold on to people, but we want them to be even greater and even better than we are. We want to release people. We want to be people that see potential in others. We want to be people that open up our lives. There's a reality that goes on that we share how we really are that helps others to keep on growing. They see the real us. And then there's something for us to do as we want to grow ourselves, as we want to be released in God's identity, that we learn to rely on God. That we're aware of our strengths and our weaknesses, but that we don't let our weaknesses hold us back. That we seek to continually grow, to continually be more like Christ. That we desire feedback, not just the nice encouragement, but sometimes the challenge as well. I can't remember where it was. We were talking somewhere. Some of you might have been there, but I can't remember where it was. So if you hear, if you heard before, you were you were obviously there. But <laughs> I, I said this story of my manager in uh, a previous sort of work context in social care. Uh, she used to use this sandwich analogy. Um, so the slice of bread was an encouragement, the filling in the middle was something you did wrong and she topped it off with another slice of bread which was an encouragement. And uh, one time I was having this meeting with her and I, I just said to her, look, do you know what, I'm happy with just bread and butter, just give me the two ends, don't worry about the middle bit, I don't need it today, I'm absolutely fine, I'm doing really well. Uh, I was a little bit arrogant. Uh, sometimes we need the challenge as well. We need the encouragement, we want to build one another up. But if no one says, hey, do you know what, there's something here for you to grow in, then we won't ever grow, will we? There's encouragement and challenge that goes together. Eugene Peterson says it like this uh, from the message. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had His eye on us. He had His eye on us. Had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything 
and in every one. I want to encourage us today that God sees things in us that we might not see. Not only that, but that we can be people that see things in others and help to help them grow. George, could you come and play? Maybe it's one of those first songs, Living Out, maybe? If that's the right one I'm thinking of, maybe. As I've been preparing this over this week, I just continually felt God wants to release something to that. I was talking to Andy a little bit earlier and I said, I want to have faith to do this. I just believe God wants to do something in us today. I'm going to ask two questions and if God's speaking to you, I'd, I'd love it. There's something about us moving that shows God that we are responding and doing what he asks. And I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's very not British and all of those things but there's something I believe God wants to do and move in us today do you want to take up the identity and calling that Christ wants to give you do you want to be who God wants you to be do you want to let go of the things that you go, I can't be that because of I've done this or I've done that. There's a release that God wants to do today that we're able to walk free in the identity of who God's called us to be. Secondly, if you know God's putting put on your heart other people that you want to be a disciple to. Today there's something fresh about saying to God, hey I want to spend time in your presence. I want to give you my life again that you would change me. That when people see me they see you. They see Jesus. And so George is going to sing and if you want to respond, I, I want to ask, would you come and stand at the front, come and kneel, whatever you need to do, but there's, there's a moving out of our chairs saying, I want that identity, or I want to realign myself to be your disciple again, so that others see. George is going to start singing, if that's you, come and move, um, and as we do that.
Thank you, Lord. Lord, today we say we want to take on your identity for us. We want to be who you have called us to be. And I pray would you release that upon us in Jesus' name. Would you lift off the things that stop us from doing that, the things that we, when we look in the mirror, we see something different. Would you release us from that in Jesus' name? That when we look in the mirror, we would see what you see in us. That we would see that hope that we would see that joy, that we would see those plans and purposes, we would see the delight that you have in us. We pray, Lord God, would you release that upon us right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, and as we recommit our lives to you, as we say, Lord God, I want to grow as you called me to grow. I want to be who you call me to be. I want to do that so that others may see something of you through it. I pray for fresh alignment right now. I pray would you bring a fresh alignment. I pray, Lord God, that over the days and weeks that you would pour out your Holy Spirit afresh that you would come and dwell with each and every one of us, that you would put songs on our lips, that you would put prayers in our hearts, Lord God, that we would be sent out to be your disciples and to make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for coming. Bless you all. Have a good week.